Access Minnesota, issues that matter to you. Access Minnesota brings you the newsmakers and the stories that shape our everyday lives with analysis from University of Minnesota faculty experts. Now, here's Jim Dubois. When the Great Recession hit, a poor job market and high college costs caused many students and parents to question the value of a college education, particularly a degree in the liberal arts, where a clear path to an occupation is not always obvious. The economy is recovering, but the concern over college debt and the usefulness of a liberal arts degree remains. This month on Access Minnesota, we talked to Dr. John Coleman, who is in the middle of his first academic year as Dean of the University of Minnesota's College of Liberal Arts. We'll discuss how CLA prepares students for the job market and what the future looks like for the U of M's largest college. Our guest is Dr. John Coleman. He's the Dean of the University of Minnesota's College of Liberal Arts. He was appointed Dean this past summer. Prior to that, he was the Chair of the Political Science Department at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he taught for over 20 years. He is also a Professor of Political Science at the University of Minnesota. Dean Coleman, welcome to Access Minnesota. Thank you so much. Thrilled to be here. Dean, first of all, tell us a bit about the College of Liberal Arts. How many students are enrolled in it at both the undergraduate and graduate levels? We're at about 13,600 at the undergrad level. We have around 1,600, 1,700 at the, the graduate level. So we are, we are a big college. We are the largest college in the state of Minnesota. And uh, I would like to say we have the largest economic impact of any of the colleges because we send a lot of graduates out into Minnesota who are doing the work in their communities and, and for the state in general. What are some of the most popular programs and majors in CLA? Right now, the, the, the largest majors are psychology, economics, communication studies is large as well, political science is, is a large major. We're seeing a lot of growth in statistics, both from students taking those courses as well as deciding to major in statistics as well. And I think all that, that is understandable. Students are thinking about statistics as being quite applicable to a lot of the careers that they're taking. So those are, those are the, the, the largest three and the biggest growth I think we've seen is in statistics. Today's U of M students are certainly the best and the brightest in the U's history. Tell us about the freshman class of 2014 for CLA. What are some stats that uh, our viewers might find interesting? Well, this class is the most, uh, truly the most accomplished uh, that we've had in, uh, in our history, whether you look at the uh, percentage of students who are in the top 10% uh, of, uh, of their class, whether you look at ACT scores, whether you look at grades in high school, academically they're, they're off the charts. But it, what I think is really interesting about this class too is that we still have a significant uh, percentage of our students who are first generation students. We're, we're, we're taking in a lot of uh, first timers in college. I think it's about 30% uh, for us. Our uh, minority students are about 20% uh, of our total. International students are about 10%. So it's a very diverse class and a very talented class. You taught for 20 some years at the University of I Wisconsin, did. Madison. <laughs> Tell us more about your teaching experience there. Well, at Madison, I taught everything from very large classes at the undergrad level to, uh, to graduate seminars. So I taught introduction to American politics classes or as large as 500 students, sometimes, uh, sometimes larger. Uh, I have to say I enjoyed those classes because you get to be uh, uh, a little more of an actor and a little more uh, out there in those classes where you can have some fun. And so we did try to make those classes fun but very, uh, very informative as well. I taught small undergraduate seminars as well. My areas of, of focus are political parties, uh, economic policy, I taught, class, I taught the general American politics class as well, and I taught some political history as well. What attracted you to the University of Minnesota? Well, there's a couple of things. One is the strength of the university overall is outstanding. There are a number of great colleges here, and there are departments and programs throughout the university that are really world, uh, world class. So that's very exciting to be in an environment where it's not just your school, but you're surrounded by others that are strong as well. The other thing was the, within the college itself. We have a lot of strengths in the college, but I also sense that this was a college where people were feeling, we could do even better, we can be even stronger, we can make some changes, we can start thinking about the, uh, about the future. That was really exciting to me. This was not a uh, college where people were resting on their laurels saying, we figured it all out, nothing to worry about here. These are, these are uh, faculty, staff, students who are really committed thinking, how can we make the college even stronger and better? 
for someone coming in from the outside, leaving a place they've been for a long time, that was exciting for me to be coming to a place where there was a lot of excitement about the possibility of the future. You were beginning your second semester as the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts. Was there anything that happened during your first semester that you witnessed or encountered that surprised you? Well, I had the good fortune that my appointment was announced, it's really about a year ago now, so I had a lot of time prior to arriving to campus to meet with people. I was coming up every month. I also had a lot of phone conversations and so on, so I had a pretty good sense of the, uh, of the lay of the land. I guess the one thing I would say that surprised me the most, perhaps, was I knew the college had been through some challenges over the last six to seven years. The number of students had been down. The budgets were difficult. And uh, that, that uh, clearly weighs on people. And you know, when you're in an environment where you feel like things are getting smaller and smaller and you don't know what, uh, what might happen next, what, ne what next shoe might drop, um, I could tell that that was weighing on people when I, uh, when I came here and that there was a sense of, both with, along with that optimism and excitement, there was also a sense of worry and concern that maybe we're just in a, in a pattern that's going to keep repeating itself. So I really tried to, from the start, say, I am optimistic about this college and about the liberal arts. We're, we're going to be advocating for the liberal arts, not apologizing. We're going to be an offense and not defense. And we're going to start thinking about what can this college be and what kinds of things can we do that will excite people and that will pull people together. So that was probably the thing that uh, I knew it was there, certainly. Um, but I wanted to make sure quickly that we started to move past that so that it's not the weight of history that's, that's really on people's minds, but more the opportunities in the future. In your view, what makes CLA a strong and unique college? A couple of things I would point to. One is that we do have a range of very, uh, uh, very strong departments here where that students can choose a multiple uh, set of majors and, and get a great education. We also have a very committed uh, uh, faculty here. One of the very first things that I did when I uh, got here, within the first week, I was talking to prospective students and their parents about why they should choose the College of Liberal Arts. And I did tell them that I was new uh, myself. And one of the things that I pointed out to them was faculty here are so engaged in the process of trying to encourage you to come to this university that it was really quite striking. So on that day, we had over 100 of our faculty we have 500 faculty in the college, so a fifth of the faculty were involved in meeting with students in small groups, telling them about their research, telling them about possible majors, and so on. So we have faculty who are very passionate and committed about helping today's students, and that to me was incredibly exciting. How do you plan to improve the College of Liberal Arts in the years ahead? Well, we've put together what we call our CLA Roadmap, and there are uh, five goals that we've articulated. Let me just indicate uh, three of those right now. Uh, one is a commitment to making sure that our students are completely feeling comfortable when they go out on the job market. One of the struggles in the liberal arts today is that students are a little worried, am I going to be able to get a job? Their parents are worried, spending a lot on tuition. Are we going to be, is our son or daughter going to be able to get a job when they, uh, when they finish? So we're working very hard on what we're referring to as student readiness, as career readiness, so that students come out feeling like they are ready to hit the ground running, they know what their liberal arts training can do for them in terms of career opportunities, and that they're confident, not just about that first job, but they're confident about what they can do three and five years out if they want to, uh, want to change direction. So we're investing a lot of time and energy and resources there. Uh, secondly, I have been saying from day one that we will have a relentless focus on research excellence. I want people to know that the liberal arts are about research, too. I think sometimes it's viewed as that's where the teaching is done. The teaching is done here, but fabulous research is being done here as well. And it's the research that really drives what faculty are doing in the classroom and that uh, students are getting a chance here to take classes with the people writing the books, writing the articles, doing the experiments, having the innovations, and not just having it on a syllabus at, at another university. So that's a real plus that we have to offer our students. So we are committed to uh, research excellence, to putting resources there, to valuing it both in tangible and in intangible ways. We have great departments. I want us to have some even better uh, departments. I want us to have more of those departments that are in the top 10, top 15, top 20 in the country. And then the third of the, um, the big commitments that we've made through our roadmap is a much deeper sense of engagement with our community and with the state and with our alumni. 
We're a large college. We have about 150,000 alumni. We have so many of them that are passionate to help the college. They want to, to give back in some way. They want to help today's students, whether that means helping with an internship placement or helping a student with a stipend or a scholarship or meeting with them to talk about careers, all sorts of different things. We want to find ways to harness that and to use that for today's, th that energy and excitement for today's students. When we think of research at a university, we normally think of work being done by graduate students, but are there opportunities for undergrads in CLA to actually do research? There are, there are indeed. One of the signature programs we have is uh, called our Freshman Research and Creative Awards Program. And with that program, freshman students just coming in get to work with a faculty member on a research or creative project in their, uh, in their spring semester. So it's an introduction to them to what the research process is like. What do professors do? What does it mean to, mean to create knowledge? And importantly, what does it mean to communicate that knowledge? Because if we keep the knowledge bottled up in a, uh, in a lab or in a professor's office, then how does the world know about it? So students learn how professors are communicating their research uh, as well. I am so proud of this program. I can't take credit for it. It was here long before uh, I got here. But of our incoming students this year, we were at about 80 of them who were participating in this program. I hope we'll be able to grow that, uh, grow that even fur further because I think that really gets students in at the ground floor, their very first year, understanding how research works. And then many of our professors do along the course of students' careers have need for students to be research assistants, lab assistants, and so on. And not just this initial group that got the, the positions as freshmen, Many other students along the way get opportunities, uh, opportunities as well. Our faculty are researchers. They're creative people. They need, they need help. Some of that comes through graduate students, but our undergrad students are very much plugged into the research exercise here. When Access Minnesota returns, Dr. John Coleman discusses the challenges he faced his first semester as Dean of the College of Liberal Arts. Access Minnesota will return after these messages. You're watching Access Minnesota. Here's Jim Dubois. Now back to our discussion with University of Minnesota College of Liberal Arts Dean John Coleman on Access Minnesota. CLA is far and away the biggest college on the University of Minnesota campus. What are some of the unique challenges of leading such a large and diverse college? Well, it is, it is a large college, and we have a lot of departments and uh, a lot of units, and the liberal arts, by their very nature, are a diverse set of disciplines and interdisciplinary uh, areas. So in a college like ours, uh, part of the job of, of leadership is to try to um, set direction and set goals and then hope that people are engaged by those, excited by those, and that they will then do, uh, do much of the, the work in addition to make that, uh, make that happen. We are not a, um, it would be harder for us to have, for example, we're doing a curriculum, for example, like you might do in some other schools that are more specialized because the liberal arts are so, so diverse. So we have to both um, uh, take advantage of that uh, uh, diversity, that we have lots of different subject matter, lots of approaches, lots of departments, uh, at the same time that we create an environment that students can navigate through without being entirely confused about how do my classes fit together, how does one subject area apply to the other? How do I even know how to start thinking about a major when there's you know, well over 30 uh, majors that I can choose from and a lot of minors and, and so on. So helping our students navigate through, we want to make sure that students are not, um, we want to make the big small is the way that I put it, put it, that we don't want students to come in and feel like this college is so large I don't know how to, I don't know how to deal with it exactly. So how can we help shrink that down so that it's at a, a student scale, um, if you will. And as far as uh, our faculty go and so on, great, wonderful, talented faculty. I want to make sure they're in a position to thrive, make sure we're not standing in their way, and make sure that these are creative people. I want them to be in a position where they can be creative to their full potential. Um, so finding exactly the mechanisms to do that, the tools, the resources, the incentives to make that happen is part of the challenge. And it will vary a lot across different departments and different faculty members. This past December, there was a public event here at the university, a holiday light show that was a collaborative effort between the College of Science and Engineering, the College of Design, and the College of Liberal Arts. Are you uh, anticipating there'll be more such collaborations between CLA and other colleges 
here at the university? Uh, no doubt about it. And we do have, as you mentioned, we have collaborations now at the faculty level. Uh, our associate dean for research has been working on collaborations between CLA and the College of Science and Engineering. We have a joint program, a minor in public health with the School of Public Health. And there are more of these discussions that are, uh, that are going on. And I have to say that partly ties to my view of, uh, of the liberal arts. I take a pretty expansive view of the liberal arts. My own background, I went to MIT. So I got my PhD at MIT, surrounded by engineers and uh, science folks and technical people and so on. And MIT actually has great liberal arts programs as well. And one of the things that I think is um, conveyed there is that they're all connected. And I very much take that. The liberal arts don't really stop at the edge of CLA. Our, our students, to be well-trained, should be taking classes out in other colleges. Our faculty should be doing collaboration, as they do, doing collaborations with other schools. We might think about degrees and certificates that we can create. But because the liberal arts are the base, and it certainly is helpful to reach out to these other, uh, these other programs, business, engineering, science, biological science, uh, public health, and so on. So I'm really excited about that. And I think there's a lot of enthusiasm among the deans on this campus to see more of that kind of collaboration between their, uh, between their schools. We're currently in the process of developing a master's in uh, human rights that's joint between us and the Humphrey School uh, of uh, uh, Public Affairs. So we are very active in that space. I think you'll see a lot more of that in the years ahead. One of your priorities as dean has been to listen to the CLA community, the university community, and the greater community. And already you've heard a lot of feedback. What are you hearing both positive and negative? Well, some of the things that we hear on the concern side, I would say, is um, access to uh, the institution. There's questions about uh, the cost of tuition, just uh, simply the fact that the university has become much more competitive for admission uh, over time. So we certainly hear about, uh, hear about that, uh, that concern. On the, on, on the, another concern, I guess I would say, is on the student side and the parent side, that assurance that a student will be ready to get a job, to have a career when they, when they get done. Are the liberal arts relevant? So we have that, we hear that concern, and we are trying to address that, uh, address that head on. On the you know, positive side of things, um, there's just a lot of uh, enthusiasm. People who've gone through and gotten liberal arts degrees and gone on and have very interesting lives and careers are so passionate about why it mattered, uh, why it mattered to them. And to hear that and to hear that reinforcing message and to let our students know, this is you someday. You'll be the grateful uh, recipient of that liberal arts training. You will have had a great, uh, great life. That's been, uh, it's been wonderful, really, to, to hear that from our alumni and the community uh, more broadly as well. I think people really want the College of Liberal Arts to be successful and to do well. And I'm, you know, for me, being in my position, obviously, that's incredibly exciting. How do you plan to educate employers on the value of a liberal arts education? You know, here's one of the things that is, is working in our favor, is that a lot of employers really were liberal arts students, uh, students themselves. So, and I know that they're, they're looking for some of the things that we, uh, that we teach, whether it's in terms of uh, being thoughtful, critical thinkers, problem solvers, analyzing problems from multiple perspectives, working in groups, understanding cultural differences, being creative, what I always say is that the liberal arts, that is entrepreneur training. The liberal arts trains you to think entrepreneurially. You're always looking around the next corner. You're asking why. You're asking why not. You're asking can it be done differently. You're looking at it from the direction of history, economics, um, literature, the languages, uh, on and on. So from all these multiple perspectives. When you look at a problem, you, you, your training tells you to look at it in multiple directions. That's exactly what entrepreneurs do. It's exactly what people in business are doing. So we are going to be trying to create some uh, partnerships with businesses in the Twin Cities uh, where we establish a relationship with them that they come and look at liberal arts, that they make sure that when they come to campus, they're seeing our students as well, that we're creating internship opportunities with, uh, uh, with their organizations so they will see just what our students can do when they're on the job. I think there's actually a lot of um, uh, openness to the liberal arts among, uh, among employers, and I've certainly had them tell me, uh, tell me as much. But we have to make a little bit more of an effort to reach out and say, here's how you can easily reach our students. Here's how you can have access to them. Here's how you can learn about them. Here are the things that they know. 
we have to help our students as well convey what they know. How do you articulate what you've done on campus in your liberal arts training to something that means, means something to the employer? So don't say it in academic speak, but say it in employer language that will make sense to them. So that's, that's the student's responsibility. It's our responsibility. And with the help of employers, I think we'll have a great uh, partnership. What would you say to prospective CLA students and their parents who might have some concerns about the career prospects for liberal arts majors? Well, one thing I would tell them is that the data all show that liberal arts students do tremendously well. Even if you came out of school and you're not immediately making as much in income as someone from another school, that quickly evens out over time. But more importantly, your job options, your career options are much more varied coming out of a liberal arts, uh, liberal arts background. The skill set that you've developed can be applied to lots of different career paths. And we see that, I mean, one thing you can do in any of our departments is just point to the list of alumni. Point down that list and say, wow, that's an astonishing array of different career paths that people went into and that they were qualified to go into because of the liberal arts degree uh, that they got. So one is pointing to the, the reality, the statistics, the history, so that people know that liberal arts students go on to become liberal arts alumni who are incredibly, uh, incredibly uh, successful. What will the future look like for the University of Minnesota's largest college? When Access Minnesota returns, Dean Coleman talks about his plans for the College of Liberal Arts. Access Minnesota will return after these messages. You're watching Access Minnesota. Here's Jim Dubois. Here's more on the future of the U's College of Liberal Arts with Dr. John Coleman. President Obama has proposed that two-year community colleges should offer free tuition for students. What effect might this proposal have on prospective CLA students, and would it change the college's mission or focus in any way? I don't think that initiative itself would directly change our, our, our focus. We have a lot of transfer students who come into CLA. I think when people think of a four-year college, the first thought is those new students coming in as uh, as freshmen who go on for their four-year career. But we admit very nearly as many transfer students as we do uh, undergraduate students. So we're at about 24 new freshmen each year, and then we are at about 1,700 or so transfer students that we take in every year as well. Those students are coming from community colleges. They're coming from uh, schools in other states. They may be coming from other parts of the, um, uh, the U of M system. So for us, the relationship with community colleges and technical colleges has been great because a lot of those students do then continue their training with us as sophomores, juniors, or seniors. So I don't think the free tuition part will change that relationship that we have. We've, we've been able to serve a lot of community college students who've come in as transfers. I think that'll completely continue to be the case. What do you hope the college will look like in the year 2020? Well, I, one thing I would say is that we're a more nimble, innovative, entrepreneurial, if you will, uh, college so that we've developed, uh, for example, uh, seed funding for faculty research that we can get those, those projects uh, kick-started, where we can bring people together for a, a few years where they're working on some problems. And it, it doesn't have to be forever. One of the, the uh, concerns in academia is that once you create something, it may never go away. Yeah. But we can create things that solve problems, address issues for a year or two or three, and then the funds are used for something else. So I want us to be very flexible in how we think about what we're investing in on the, uh, on the research side. The other, uh, one other thing that I would point to in that flexibility is, can we find more uh, flexible programming for our students? New ways of thinking about online learning, blended learning, uh, taking some classes in multiple colleges here for new degrees, new certificates, and so on. Uh, I think our students want some of that. Uh, they may not know exactly what they want, but that uh, idea of being able to flexibly create their, uh, their experience here I think is attractive to them, and I think it would serve us, uh, serve us well. The third thing I would want to make sure uh, that we see in the college, both in the research but maybe even especially on the teaching side, is that we are being attentive to uh, major shifts in interest in our, uh, our student body. So for example, we have a lot of students who come to us with interest, I mentioned healthcare before, they have interest in healthcare. How are we investing in that area given that I think we would both agree 
healthcare is not an issue that's going away anytime soon. It'll grow as a concern. There, it's a very complex, it's you know, a sixth of the US economy. How can we integrate what we do in the liberal arts more clearly into uh, the area of healthcare? So whether it's through hiring new faculty who have research specialties in that area, whether it's through new programs that we do joint with our college and with other colleges, but for students who have those, those interests. But that's also true for us. We have students, we have a lot of students who are interested in business careers. They may or may not have wanted to go to a, a business uh, school or a business program, but in any case, they're in the College of Liberal Arts and they want a business, a business future. So how do we think about some creative programming that really works for that set of students who are going into these areas that are growing and that some of the programming can happen in, C, uh, in CLA, but we also may need to uh, work with other colleges as well. So I really want us to think about how can we be nimble and flexible, innovative, active and entrepreneurial in trying to meet our teaching and our research needs. Dr. John Coleman is the Dean of the College of Liberal Arts at the University of Minnesota. Dean Coleman, thanks so much for joining us on Access Minnesota. Thank you, Jim, it's been a great pleasure. That's all for this month's edition of Access Minnesota. We'll see you again next month. Thanks for watching. Access Minnesota, issues that matter to you. Join us again next week as we bring you the newsmakers and stories that shape our everyday lives. Access Minnesota is produced by the Minnesota Broadcasters Association in cooperation with the University of Minnesota's College of Liberal Arts.